welcome back to this episode of the Law of Relevancy podcast. We just celebrated 4th of July, and as everyone knows, 4th of July is brought to you by the American military. Today we're joined by Troy Daylin. He is the president of the Special Operations Memorial Foundation right here in Tampa Bay, on the base, and is also a retired senior master sergeant in the Air Force. And as a SEER specialist, is that correct? Correct, a SEER specialist. Well, it's good to be here, Cord. I appreciate you uh, inviting me on the, uh, the show. Thanks for joining us, Troy. Yeah. So, yeah, SEER it actually stands for Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. And you're right, I did that for 24 years in the Air Force. And it, it was a great time the whole 24 years. I couldn't have had a better job in the military. Well, you know, I actually tell my son all the time he should strongly consider a career in the military. I usually recommend the Coast Guard so I can still see him, but uh, but that does sound uh, sound pretty exciting what you did. I mean, 24 years, we've had a lot of conflicts during that time. Right, so when I first got in back in 95, I mean, there really wasn't a whole lot of conflict. There was a lot of training that went on, but really we didn't get into conflict until we hit September, September 11th, 2001. So in that time, you know, I really didn't foresee a huge amount of travel in my future because we're doing most of our stuff stateside, or as they call Ocona. So, um, yeah, it was, it was an interesting time being part of the military during September 11th. I would imagine, yeah, I, I knew quite a few people who actually joined after 9-11. Right. But uh, I've met very few people who've actually been, were in the military at that time. Mm-hmm. What was that like actually going through that and having to deal with or like, what were the communications? What was that? What did that look like? Being already being in the military because you joined back before it was, it was pretty right. chill. I would imagine it was kind of chill, but we were also set on a different course at the time. We were really training towards a Cold War era, so really all our stuff was focused on Eastern Europe, yeah. uh, and then obviously September 11th changed all that, and we ended up going with something different. You know, we had to change really the mindset that we had against the enemy that we had to be faced with, so. Yeah, well, I imagine so. So at that time, so you, you joined the military as an enli- in the enlisted side, correct? correct? Mm-hmm. And you worked your, your way all the way up to the very highest rank on the enlisted side, correct? Chief Master Sergeant's the highest. I've got two. A senior Master Sergeant was one below that. Okay, one below that. And then what was, so what was your motivation? Well, what was your background and what was your motivation for joining the military? Well, I think my motivation was, even from a very early age, I wanted to join the military. Uh, I was heavily involved with sports, going through high school. I played basketball. And really, at that time, when I was going into thinking about what's next, as I was leaving high school, college and playing basketball seemed like a good fit. So I uh, went to the University of Maine, played basketball there for a year. Uh, After that, I went to the University of New Hampshire after a year, came down a little bit closer to home for me. I was born in New England, in New Hampshire to be specific. So University of New Hampshire is 30 minutes from my house. I did not play basketball there. I ended up getting heavily involved because my degree was in forestry. I ended up getting into what's called, uh, at the time, lumberjack sports. Mm-hmm. So if you saw any of those things on ESPN where you guys got competing, you know, chopping wood and climbing up trees, that's what I did. The Paul Bunyan stuff. Yeah, so Steel Timber Sports Series, I competed on that series for probably the next three years as I was going through college and then uh, eventually into the military. How did you do? What was your career like on the, on the tour? Well, first of all, it's a blast, right? I get to travel all over the place. And for a New England kid, I hadn't really done a whole lot of traveling. So getting to check out the United States, travel was always something that kind of nagged at me. That's why I thought the military would also be a good opportunity. I could travel a little bit. I had no idea that I'd be traveling to 42 different countries in the time that I was in the military. And, oh, by the way, you know, spent a lot of that time in the Middle East. Yeah, and you weren't just sightseeing. No, not a whole lot of sightseeing going on. Although, to be fair, right, everyone is always like, hey, thank you for your service. We really, you know, are 
grateful for you going out there and doing something. And I'm, it's always warming to me, but I also had a lot of fun. Even during times of, you know, we're in Afghanistan, Iraq, there's fun to be had. I mean, you're over there with all your, your brothers and sisters, if you will. You're all sharing the same goals, same mission. But there's fun to be had in there. Like what? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's, uh, everybody's like, well, tell me about all the combat. And to be honest with you, I mean, there's combat, no doubt. And there's guys that are facing the combat every day. What I see here is heavily involved with combat search and rescue personnel recovery, so we're on a, a big stick to go ahead and do a lot of the planning that's involved with that, to do the tracking, to make sure that all the aircraft that are taken off or special ops teams that are going in are accounted for. So there's a lot of dead time in there. So you're mainly spending a lot of time like planning. A lot of time planning, yep. Uh, there were times of execution right at the very beginning of the war, you know, especially as we had heightened conflict, you know, guys were getting shot up pretty bad, and I was attached to a rescue unit, so guys were going out and doing medevacs at that same time, so a lot of, uh, a lot of guys being brought back that way. And then, so that's, that was your main role, is to go out, if, so if someone got shot down, or somehow got stuck behind in, in lines or whatever, your job is to go secretly go get them and pluck them back? We have guys to go ahead and do that, and that's what they, and pararescue is, mm -hmm. That's their whole mission is just to go out and grab the guy and bring him back. Yeah. All the rest of the stuff falls within SEER specialist realm. Okay. Right, it's the planning, the execution of the whole thing. It's to make sure that we're coordinated with aircraft and then really just big comm links throughout everything. And since we know how everyone is trained, we have a probably a pretty good vantage point on where these people are going to end up going or the isolated personnel is going to go. Yeah. Well. Troy, thank you for your service. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, speaking of uh, strategy and also um, planning, right? So you've just recently transitioned out of the military in the past couple of years, and now you're in the civilian world. And that's really what we like to talk about on the law of relevancy. We like to talk about business, marketing, communications. We like to talk about strategies that go into What's happening now, like out there in the business world and in the marketing and comms world? And so you had, uh, it, I would assume that you had some foresight into your retirement. You were planning for it. Tell me a little bit about that transition process and, and how you prepared for it. So I would say probably about the 15-year mark for me, I knew that when I was going to go ahead and leave the military, I was always going to get into business doing something, right? Uh, there's so many different opportunities out there. As soon as my service was done, I started exploring that. So I made sure that my academic and my, uh, my education backed up some of the stuff that I was looking to get into. So I went and got graduate degrees in, in management and an MBA just to go ahead and shore up some of those things in the textbook, right. you know, because I wasn't getting a whole lot of that. Now, management and leadership, you get that in spades in the military can't get away from it really so I had 24 years just kind of developed personally and professionally leading people and managing different programs and setting things up which also as I got out I found it quite interesting there's a lot of overlap with what goes on in the civilian business space to what goes on in the military I'd say the biggest thing between the civilian side and the private sector and in the military it's typically, I'm not working a P&L, profit and loss statement. Where in the civilian world, you're, if you're a good business owner, I mean, you're tied to that, so you can really see where the revenue is coming in and how it flows throughout your business. In the military, we have a budget that we work against, and that's really about it. Now, we have to be good stewards of the money. It is taxpayer dollars. But at the end of the day, it's not like it's a profit and loss statement that I'm working with. Right. Right. If a business isn't maintaining a positive P and L over a long enough time period, that they're out of business, right? right? Well, in the military, it's the we would have been out of business a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, well, the, the goals are very different, right? For they're, sure. They're worse, yeah. Right? I don't know if a little bit of the tropical storm is interfering with our microphones. 
um, but maybe pull it a little bit closer just in case. Um, so you plan for that transition. You got the education. You, uh, which is, you know, what it sounds like you have. You have several master's degrees, right? I have a master's degree. I have an MBA, and then I have a master's in management. And so, from like, a, like a, from a, a normal like educational standpoint, it seems like uh, at least on the education side, you you would be a par with someone who's got an MBA, someone who's like maybe 25, 26, just you know spent a lot of time on the education side, and is all ready to like jump into. Right. Well, I would say there's a whole thing, there's a whole bunch of things that you learn when you come out and you've never executed an MBA, right? You, you got all this book knowledge in you, and now you're actually in a business. Now I was lucky when I came out, I worked for a, a consulting firm, and we would go into companies and and work. And I quickly found out that there was a lot of similarities, right? Yeah. Definitely throughout the management side, but you learn a whole lot of regulation and compliance side too. So they don't really teach in an MBA. And there's financials that you have to understand. And um, so I would say with some of the mechanics that go into a business, just being in the business day to day, working those things, now you can just start applying some of the MBA. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I would just think the reason I bring that up is because, I mean, if this is like a horse race and you've got, you know, your previous experience versus someone with no experience but the same education, I would think that. Like, it's an easy choice. I'm going to pick the veteran over the person with no experience. Yeah, so there, I guess there's two sides of that. Um, a lot of people, especially that support the military, is like, oh, I'd love to have a veteran in there. That They seem to have good planning. They're disciplined, right? They're organized, so on and so forth. The, uh, and that does happen, right? You get those types of veterans. But then you get people that may not have any connection to the military that are kind of... They back off from the veteran a little bit just from the standpoint they're like, oh, I have this preconceived notion that you know, maybe they're too disciplined, right? They're not going to fit into the culture. Right? And they start going down this, this trail, whereas if they had somebody that from the private sector they were looking to hire or a veteran, sometimes it's going to fall to the private sector. Because they're like, oh, you've been out here for 20 years. This guy has been in the military for 20 years. Who's got the most experience? Well, it's got to be the guy from the private sector, right? That's not always the case. Right. Well, I, I know that, you know, just in talking with some of the, uh, the people that I know that are in the military and have transitioned, uh, I mean, you are managing budgets. You are doing project planning. You are executing on a lot of, lead, you know, you're leading teams. You're, you're getting a lot of work done. And really, there's, there is no option for failure. And there's 100% accountability. So it does seem like it's a great proving ground. Jeez, if there's no room for failure, I sure did fail a lot in the military. And it's usually the interesting thing about I had no better laboratory than really the military, and I hate to call it a laboratory, but I got to meet so many different people from the United States, right? We got all walks of life going into the military. And then just with the the cultural side of all the countries that we went into, you know, now you're having to manage people in that space as well. So over the course of that time in the military, I really got a good understanding of how people react to certain things and how to deal with difficult situations. Obviously, you get you know, more familiar as you go through your, your career, and I'm not done learning yet. Right? I'm still learning stuff about people. But 24 years, you get, a, you get a bump on it, and more so than I would say on the civilian side because they're kind of focused either in their one spot like some people have never left Tampa before, you know, and I've, I've lived in many different states. You know, they get in their comfort zone. They have their network. You know, those were some of the things, and I guess we'll get to that as well, how important that network is. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. So um, one of the things that you did when you were transitioning is you focused a lot on networking, right? And, and in business, it's extremely important, right? So tell us how you got that done. So networking, just in the military, really to get things done, you needed to know the right people to get things done. No different in the civilian world, right? I was looking throughout the, uh, 
really throughout the different sections within the military, like, oh, you, you need someone from admin to help you with payroll, or you need somebody from operations to help you plan this mission, or whatever it happened to be, you had a guy or a girl in these different areas. That, and then you start to build a network of those people. So the more people that you have on board or more people that you know and understand what their jobs are, when something pops up, a problem that needs to be solved, I don't need to solve the problem entirely, but I know the people that can help me solve the problem. And in the private sector, I mean, it's the same thing, right? You know, payroll companies, you know, marketing companies, you know, you know people out of all these different functions or activities within the private sector that you can start to pick their brain on things, right? Get knowledge. So it's, it's very helpful as we're coming out of the military. Well, I'd say this is a really strong leadership quality, right? Is to, to immediately look to delegate, you know, like get boned up on something, right? And figure it out and then, and then look to delegate it so you can scale, correct? Well, sure. And, and there's some people that don't do a very good job of delegating, right? And they take it all on themselves and it creates a bunch of stress that you just don't need. But when you have the right people on your team to do it, I mean, you get those things knocked out pretty quick and a lot better than you can do it as an individual, right? I'm just lucky that I've, Tampa's just been so gracious. They're gracious to the military. But once my wife and I, Lori, knew that we were going to settle here in Tampa, I mean, a couple of years ago before I got out of the military is when I really started to get involved with the community, get involved with different networking groups, and kind of understand the business environment that I was going into. Because we would do the same thing in the military. If we were going, like, Afghanistan, I would get as much as I possibly could on Afghanistan. The people, the culture, the landscape, and you start to learn it. Right? The flowers. Everything. The poppies. That's right. A lot of poppies over there. <laughs> yeah. so. Exactly. All right. Well, very good. So, so what, what veterans organizations are you involved with? So right now, I'm involved with the uh, Special Operations Memorial Foundation. So I've been on that board for the last four years. And really, it was a couple of years ago, we were going through a course on MacDill. And they're like, hey, we're going to go over the memorial for Special Operations. I'm like, okay. So we go over there. I had no idea. I had been in the community for a long time. had no idea that there was even a memorial there. So the president at the time, Jeff Barker, was like, uh, gave this whole spiel. And afterwards, I was like, hey, I live here in Tampa. I would really like to be involved with the board. I can just help with the branding side. I can let people know. Uh, and he's like, yeah, come on board. So I was on the board of directors just as a regular director for about a year. And then as Jeff left, he's like, hey, would you take over as the president? Right. So, of course, I'm going to take that opportunity. I, I have so many friends on that wall, right? I know the families. I know the kids. I, you know. It, this is a memorial that mm -hmm. honors those special operators and any of the branches that are all, quote, unquote, special operators right. that have lost their lives. Correct. So, really, since the, uh, the incident that hap happened in Iran during the hostage situation, we had a team go in there from the Army and the Air Force. And there was a huge accident they called Desert One or Eagle Claw was the operation. So that's where we take the, uh, the memorial from 1980, right, April 1980, to present day. There's been two memorials on that site. So originally when they developed the foundation back in 95, June of 95, they're like, okay, we're going to go ahead and put a bunch of guys that we know to the board, the current board. We're going to put them on the wall. We want to preserve their legacy. And then September 11th, almost 20 years ago, kicked off. And then we quickly started losing room on that memorial. So in 2007, they developed another memorial that's actually in the shape of the SOCOM spear, which is an old OSS uh, emblem. And... Currently, we have about 919 killed in action, killed in training, from all the services. That's Army, Navy, Marines are on there, and Air Force. So. And every one of the branches has their own special operations. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. But 
I, I want to circle back to something you said you did, and I think it's a skill that people should really learn how to do, and that's go volunteer, go, whether it's volunteer to like be on the task force at your company, or go volunteer to help out with some good cause and figure out a way that you can be involved in like a higher level and it leads to other opportunities, right? And I know that you didn't do that in order to, like you were there to honor those guys, but that is something that can help open, you know, the door. Yeah, to a point, right? So there is volunteer work that goes into the memorial, right? It takes a lot of, a lot of time and effort. What a lot of folks don't understand is like the Department of Defense does not pay for that memorial. It is all privately funded. The foundation owns the land, owns the wall. Special Operations Command doesn't own that, and they can't, they can't go out there and conduct fundraisers or any of that. So I'm heavily involved with the business community, not here, just here in Tampa, really across the United States and the globe, if you want to look at it like that. Uh, Gemini Industries is out of Tampa. They helped us out quite a bit this year with uh, their partnership. So they came into the memorial and said, hey, we can, we can help you with a lot of these things and help pay for just the regular operation. That's putting tiles on, that's taking right. care of the statues, making sure the memorial's painted. Not to mention, the, you know, it's an all-volunteer board, so nobody gets paid. Right. And a lot of us have other jobs that we do. So having other partners come in like Gemini is been instrumental to keeping that memorial up. That yeah, I would definitely want to know more about how I can help out too if they come past. Yeah. Um, but in terms of uh, like stepping up and asserting yourself, I mean, it's a very entrepreneurial type of behavior. Correct. Right? To, to insert yourself as a lead into a, some kind of a role in a leadership capacity, right? And really, I mean, do you see yourself as an entrepreneur? I mean, I've, yeah, I think that word gets used a lot and sure, I, I got characteristics that probably lean in that way. Whenever in the military you would go to a different spot, you would have to figure out things really quick, right? Who pushes the buttons in these different areas? Who do I partner with? That's the same thing that you do in the entrepreneur world. You land somewhere, let's say just Tampa. Well, who do I know in cybersecurity, right? And you start reaching out to these different companies or hey, what are the different activities that really help me start my business, like payroll and HR? So you start getting in on the ground quickly and figuring stuff out. Of course, you're putting in long hours and, you know, just reading a lot and trying to develop yourself professionally and personally to make those things happen. So, so yeah, I guess if you could go ahead and say it that way, there's, some, there's a lot of entrepreneurs within the military and it's shown, you know, once they've gotten out, they've been extremely successful. Right. American Freedom Distillery, mm -hmm. right here in St. Petersburg, run by veterans, right? You look at Black Rifle Coffee, yeah. started by veterans. And it's usually at its most basic level, they're working out of their garage, if you will, making sure that they're, you know, getting the things that they need to get their business up and being successful. They've proven it in the military with their ability to lead and their you know, they can identify the people that they need on their team that have better skills than they do. I guess that's probably the most humbling thing, right? You can't know everything. You need experts that surround you to make it happen. Well, it seems like a lot of those veteran entrepreneurs have been able to take that culture of teamwork and they've been able to turn it into successful companies and, and many times surround themselves with other veterans. Correct. And they're, it's a great, almost like a, a service mm -hmm. that they're providing to people who are leaving the service because you're giving them a place to go where they get to. Yeah. So I, I will say that's, that's a slippery slope though. Um, I left the military loving every minute of the time that I spent in and having veterans that are like-minded is a good thing, but I wouldn't load the whole company up with veterans just because you need another perspective on things, right? You need the private sector. I think if you bring in both of those, you can have an extremely smart and successful business. And uh, yeah, but I, I, you got to try and keep the balance in there somewhere because now you got a bunch of uh, people, men and women, that are really well versed on management, and, you know, teamwork, leadership, and then once once you get all those personalities in there, the 
culture kind of mimics a lot of what the military brought. And uh, sometimes it just doesn't translate that well to the private sector. So you recommend like a healthy balance? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. And I've seen it, um, you know, I was part of a company before where we were bringing in veterans. And uh, we quickly just picked up where we left off. Culture was mimicking a lot of the, the military stuff. Not that we were, there was any, on the private sector, so, I mean, they were, they were loving it. They were part of the culture. They were helping build the culture. Yeah. And I think they loved the camaraderie of it all. Um, but it sometimes it just doesn't translate very well. Okay. Well, let's talk about what's next for you, Troy. So you are, I mean, you're a natural entrepreneur. You practically did it all. You know, you did that being uh, someone who had to solve problems all throughout the military, right? And, like, there's a lot on the line, you know, when it comes to, like, the things you're working on, right? So it's really important that you were successful. Um, so what's next for you? Like, where do you see, like, uh, your career going outside of the military? Well, I'm glad you asked. The, uh, so having about a year and a half outside of the military, I've worked a couple of different uh, companies, and it becomes very apparent once you get out, you're like, oh, I'm going to go ahead and work a little bit with these companies. Hopefully I can bring some value to them. But you get to a point where you're like, this value is something that uh, I want to bring into my own organization. So currently I'm working with a uh, partner of mine, and we're looking for businesses to go ahead and purchase. So we want to bring the things that we have learned, not only in the private sector, but also the military, to kind of uh, support the community, right? We served our country. Now we want to serve our community. And those are the things that we're looking forward to very soon. Yeah, I mean, I remember years ago, I had that same conversation just with myself, right? And, and it was, you know, you see, when you can learn how things get done, why not do it for yourself? Right. You know, like, yeah, you you get to be accountable for all the shots, you know? Like, if you fail, it's on you. If you win, you know, it's on you too. But at the end of the day, like, there's a certain amount of satisfaction and freedom that comes with that. Right, and I think you get to, you get to champion the culture that ends up developing in that, con that company, right, that business. And those are some of the things my partner and I really are looking forward to uh, bring into a company. Because I think there's a lot of success to be had in that. And if you look at the employee pool, if you will, people go to work to be part of something. Right. They want to have a purpose. Like some people are collecting a paycheck, and I understand that. I'm not naive to that. But a lot of folks are looking to be kind of taken care of and brought into the group. And just with, you know, spending our time in the military, I mean, that was, we're taking care of each other. A lot of times we're, we've got each other's back, we know their families, we know their kids. I mean, it's very tight-knit. And I think there's space within the business world for some of that. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Unfortunately, in the business side of things, a lot of times it boils down to salary, benefits, flexibility, you know, things like that. And a lot of times people don't really get to be a part of a really cool culture where people can feel like they're on a team, right? Right. So tell us a little bit about how to, I think that's really good information that maybe people listening to this can, can learn, is give us a little bit of, give us some tips on how we can develop that kind of a culture inside of our business. So culture is, uh, it would be nice for me to go ahead and stand at the front of the room and say this is the way our culture is going to be. But that's not really, that's not reality. The culture kind of forms itself. If you, as the owner, the, you know, the operator of that business, provide the things that they need in order to be successful, the culture kind of grows, grows like a plant, right? And then it'll go ahead and bloom when, you know, you got you to nurture it too. You got to take care of it. You don't want to be lopsided, I would say, on one side or another. Like, you can't bring in pizzas every Friday and kumbaya and do all those things because that's not realistic in a business either. I always kind of think that's a little bit superficial anyway. It, yeah, because people can tell it's fake right away. But if you're, if you're genuine about what you're doing, either in networking or you're building a culture, yeah, we'll talk more about the networking thing, but you got to be genuine with your people. Well, let's talk about a specific example. 
how to do some of the stuff that you're talking about. So would an example be making sure your people have computers at work? It, it could be, as long as they have the right resources, right, and they feel like they're being supported by the people that own the business, sure, that's part of so developing your team, right, the tools they need to get the job yep. done at quality, right? right, but as an owner, also knocking down barriers, right? If they're, if they're up against something with a client and it's, it's clearly causing them problems, that's where you as an owner can step in at that point, or their manager or their supervisor. It depends on the size of your company. Um, those are things that are important to the employee that you've got their, their back on a lot of things. And that, yes, you allow them to fail, but not to the point where it's going to be a detriment to the company. You're there to coach them through that. So as an owner, a manager, a supervisor, those are things that you do with the people that work for you uh, just to kind of help boost that thing. But there's, I mean, there's so many different things you can do with culture. Uh, just remembering their birthday. I mean, you have access to all the HR records. We'll send out a note on their birthday saying, hey, happy birthday. It's the simple things that are going to get noticed the most. Mm -hmm. It's uh, when you go overboard with stuff and you're like, oh, we're going to get T-shirts for everybody and there's balloons and there's cake and all that stuff. Not everybody appreciates that. Right. I mean, as you get older, of course, you, know, you don't want a cake every time your birthday rolls up. I definitely do not. <laughs> No, I definitely do not. I, I think a culture where people look to take care of each other and like have each other's back, I think that would that's what I want for my birthday. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. That's the number one thing I would want right. to feel appreciated. Communication is a large part of culture as well. You've got to have open communication with everybody that works in and around you or you know, as a company grows and you know, you're talking fifty to a hundred, you don't as an owner always have that availability to the, the people down doing the work for you. So there's got to be other ways that you as an owner or business leader can reach out to them and, and show that, you know, they're part of this team. So as you're transitioning now, what are some other lessons that, so we talked about culture, leadership, um, networking, what are some other things that we haven't talked about that you recommend? So it comes down to a lot of self-study. Like I, I love to read, so... I guess my wife gives me grief because I like to read business books and stuff that's probably dry for a lot of people. But I learned so much just from people that have gone before me and they're writing this stuff down. That's so helpful. Not to mention that, you know, there's master class out there that you can just pick up on many different things. Like as I left the military, I'm like, well, I need to know more about finance. I need to know more about HR and compliance and those things that aren't necessarily taught in an academic situation. But, uh, also just getting out there and, and reading what business owners have done previously because they've all made errors and they're very forthcoming in a lot of the books that I tend to read. And I also go back into history. What are some of the better leaders in our society? What have they done? Where have they failed? And you just try and pick up those little pearls along the way. So I would say as the transition happened, getting to understand a little bit more about the, I mean, this happened through the military too, but Understanding the private sector, um, I always used to joke because there's such a, you know, you got people that worked in the military and then you got people in the private sector, and sometimes it doesn't always come together. But I love the private sector. I came out of the private sector before I joined the military. I married somebody from the private sector. So there's a, there's a lot to be learned in there, and I think that's where networking comes in because mm -hmm. as you're prepping to get out, for a lot of guys, you know, they might not have the academic background. They have leadership, and management, and spades. But as they're going out, understanding a little bit more about the business environment, kind of the areas or industries that they want to be involved with, and talking to people that have been doing it for a very long time. Why not leverage all their skills and knowledge, right? And, and people have been so good to me as I was coming out of the military. I don't think... Out of the hundreds of people that I've met here in Tampa, business leaders, no one's ever said no, right? Everybody said, yeah, let's get some coffee and let's see what you got going on. Where's your head at? Yeah. And uh, they've been helping to guide the discussion, even, even currently, even though I've been out for, you know, as we're getting into purchasing a business and starting those things up, so many people out of our network, and you're part of that network as well, 
have been extremely gracious with their time and their knowledge, regardless of what industry they come out of. Because business. Those are two of the most valuable things they could possibly give you. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, and time time is tight, right? You you have meetings that are probably scheduled out a couple months in advance, and you know that's where learning to work your calendar becomes important. Yeah. Because you don't want to miss anything, but yeah, networks are huge. And I would say it's the, the single most important thing that you can do as you're leaving the military. If you have an area that you want to go into or an industry, find a mentor in those areas or many of them and just start picking their brains. But that starts with research before you go into the network. You have to understand what questions to ask. Yeah, so let's talk about that just a little bit because I think that self-discovery in that whole, like, Having a compass to even know like where you want to go. I mean, in the military, do you get to decide like where you're going next? Do you get to decide <laughs> on a limited, very limited basis, right? Sure. <clears throat> like you got A or B, you know. Right. So I came out of a very small career field, so we didn't really have a choice a whole lot of times. As you go up in rank, though. Um, then you really don't have a choice. You're like, hey, we need somebody to fill this billet. There's only a couple of you. You're going here. Um, I would say that's probably one of the, the nicest freedoms to have, stepping away from the military, is I can go ahead and decide where I want to be. I don't have to have the, uh, you know, the military dictate where that, that happens. So, so how, do you, how do you transition into that world? I mean, is that like a hard transition for some people? <sighs> Well, to be honest, well, for some people, yeah, it, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to get away from. And I would say, the longer you spend in the military, I mean, this is what you've known almost your entire adult life right. is being in the military. So waking up in the morning, doing PT, you know, being. I mean, they say our brains continue to develop until we're like twenty-five years old, right? So I mean, a lot of people are doing the military eighteen to twenty-one-ish range. Mm -hmm. So they're. It's almost like you've got these habits or whatnot that are literally part of, like, the core programming of your brain. Right. And when you come, a lot of guys that come out and aren't ready for that kind of change or transition, they can have a hard time. Yeah, no doubt. If you change anything midlife, I guess, it can cause a disruption. And the thing is, too, it causes a disruption within the family. Yeah. Your wife has been... Or you know your your husband has been gone for the better part of twenty years, constant deployments. You've been taking care of the household, and then all of a sudden they're there every day. How is Lori dealing? With oh my gosh, she is not dealing with it very well. So yeah, right? Is there something you can do other than hang out here? No. She's uh, she's pretty good with it. And she's successful in her own right, right. So she works for a big organization, and she's been with them for 24 years. So she, she understands some of the, the commitment and sacrifice that comes with a larger organization. Gotcha. Well, that's really good advice for our brothers and sisters transitioning out of the military. Um, I think you know, you know, more of them could follow in your path. I think that would probably be very satisfactory. You know, satisfa very, give them a lot of satisfaction to have some success you have. I mean, you've... You've led large organizations in your short time out of the military. Mm -hmm. I have, yeah. And it's, uh, it just gets better, mm -hmm. I think. As people transition out, I think it just gets better. Because you have so much more freedom to do the things that you want to do and pursue. And, I mean, if you've got that spirit, right, that character that just drives you on to try different things and you're not worried about the risk. The, the nice thing about coming out, especially after 20, now some people – you know, uh, leave the military before that, and they transition. But you have a little bit of a cushion because you have the 20-year mark where you're, you have benefits and you have pay coming in. So, so you can probably be more, you know, you can take more risk, I would say, than a lot of people. Right, because you still have, like, sometimes half your pay, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Half your pay, maybe there's disability benefits and things like that. Sure. That can mm -hmm. come in. Um, as a, you know, obviously as a side effect of, of a being in service, but like uh, that cushion can help you if you wanted to be a charter ca boat captain. You could do that, and right. live, you know, comfortably. 
and I know a lot of people that have done similar things, right? I know one that became a charter boat captain. He's a fishing captain right now, really enjoying what he's doing. I know some guys that have gotten out and got a pilot's license, yeah. and now they fly, you know, like business jets. So you can really do whatever you want, and that, that's the freedom that I'm talking about for their, for guys that are transitioning. Don't be don't be worried about the transition. You're going to make it through the trend. You just made it through right. the last 20 years. You can make it through transitioning into the private sector. My only cautionary tale would be, as you're getting out, you need to prep. Right? Everything we do in the military is a way of prepping before we go in and do anything. It's not like we just blindly go in places. There's a lot of preparation and research that goes in. This is no different. You need to do that as you're transitioning out of the military. And I would say all of us in the private sector need to do a lot of prep as well. I mean, even reading some of the books that you're talking about, finding mentors. Sometimes we can find mentors that we've never met. You know, it just could be some leader within, like, your industry. Right. And you can follow some of their writings and their legacy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So what's your legacy going to be, Troy? Oh, my gosh. Tell us about your book. <laughs> my book. Hopefully I can leave a legacy of where, you know, at least people remember the things that I, I brought to the table, right? I added some value somewhere along the line, or I, I was able to influence them in some way. I think the most rewarding thing for me, and now that I've stepped away from the military, I still get calls every couple of months of people that I worked with, and they're like, hey, that thing that you told me 10 years ago, that really panned out, that really worked out or the help that you gave my family, or you know, those are the things I want people to really remember me by. And doesn't everybody want some type of legacy to leave behind? Absolutely. Obviously, the, you know, the kids and the wife, right? You know, you get little clones, hopefully not clones, but, you know, little people that follow you around and they're watching everything. Well, it's, it's like that in the private sector, and it's also like that in the military. They're watching what you're doing. So you got to be on... You're 24-7, 365. you got to maintain uh, that integrity. Yeah, integrity. Yeah. Be a good example. Oh, for sure. Be helpful. Words to live by. Well, I don't know how helpful I am, but... Yeah, well, <laughs> apparently somebody's calling you from 10 years ago. Right. right. Yeah, and they didn't want money either, so that's all good. That's good. No, it's, it's really your time, your, your experience, those are the, the greatest things that you could possibly give. Pretty much anybody. Yeah, I believe so. You know, well, Troy, thanks again for joining us today. Some amazing lessons for people listening and to learn from what, a little bit of what it's like to leave the military and, and venture into the private sector. I, I would encourage more business owners to learn about the STAR Network, learn about how to connect with veterans and be able to apply some of those skills within their businesses. Yeah, definitely provide you a different perspective. Yeah, well, it's part of a healthy balance, right? That's right. That's right. Well, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to be here on the Law of Relevancy. So yeah. until next time, Court. All right, Troy. Well, thank you again for joining us. And you can follow our podcast everywhere where podcasts are found and on our social media. And we'll see you next time. Thank you again for joining us.